Dave Kindig and you're watching Bitchin' Rides Done Right. Hello friends, I'm Larry and you're watching the Portland Roadster Show with me and I've got a guest somebody I've kind of been wanting to talk to for ever since I saw him on TV. This is Dave Kindig. Larry. Good to meet you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So uh, for those that don't know who this guy is, he's got a TV show. What's up with that? They'll give anybody a TV show, right? <laughs> so what do you do on your little TV show? I mean, you, you I know you're like a working guy. What is it? What's that about? You know what? Actually, uh, I, I started out uh, very much hands on. And of course, as the years have gone by, I've had to kind of back off of that a little bit, you know, taking care of my business and the, the 26 families that basically I, I support that work for me and stuff. Great friends of mine. And so now I do most of my time uh, at the design table or down in the shop, you know, just kind of art directing, making sure that everything's kind of landing where I sold it to the client and of course taking care of the clients and, and a little bit of filming. Of course, we, we do a little bit of that. So uh, that's pretty much what takes up all my time now. Well, that's great. I want to know you know, being a huge fan of the show since the beginning of it, I want to know the things you you got here in your business. And I got to talk to your wife, amazing person. You, She's wonderful. And hearing some of how you guys kind of came up, I, I, I think people need to know a little bit about, <laughs> you know, you, you don't just like walk out of, out of life and start your own business, but some people say this is what I've done and you've got some crew guys that when you were actually studying this up you said hey Will you're like really good at this stuff maybe <laughs> you'd be good with this too I want to know how you started that how you met that crazy Kevin dude and how this came together well you know what uh, it's a funny story I mean we go way back to when I was five years old I was always fascinated actually my first design work I was always passionate about designing but my first design work was actually insects and then I very quickly found out you can't make those. So I went to my second love, which was cars. And, uh, you know, I just uh, played around a lot with Legos and Hot Wheels, got into plastic models. And my mom was an artist, and I always, you know, loved watching her paint. You know, she was doing mostly like horses and back, you know, backgrounds of, you know, forestry or whatever. My passion was very much about the cars. And I very early on decided that if I paid attention to shapes, and uh, scale and, and details that, you know, I could draw cars. It was just, I just loved doing it. So, you know, I started when I was very young. Uh, it actually got me in a lot of trouble in high school, but saved me from a lot of trouble too. I made friends with all the biggest jocks and the big Mexican cholo lowrider guys. And I knew everybody in the, uh, in the entire school and I would draw cars for them. I was pretty short until I was a junior. And uh, so, but I never got in a fight in uh, junior high or high school. I always made friends with the biggest guys. I'd draw them cars and they'd be like, hey, leave that kid alone. And so I just, you know, I just really had a great time growing up, even though it was inner city and not a lot of opportunities were going on around there. Um, kind of learned that very uh, uh, early on that if you put your mind to something, you can accomplish, you know, accomplish it. Uh, it's very much like uh, George McFly always said to Marty, you know, in Back to the Future. He says, you can put, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. Well, it's very much true. You know, I, there's really no reason I should be here. And I, when I was growing up, I learned that a lot of the people in my family were all waiting for a government check cheese, or a cheese check. And I was like, how do people get out of the hole and make something of their lives? And it didn't take very long. My grandmother was always very supportive of me. And she goes, you know, Dave, if you do what you want to do and never consider the fact that you could uh, fail, you'll never fail. If, if you haven't succeeded yet, it just means that you haven't got there yet. Just keep going. And uh, so, you know, very much that's where I came from. Worked at a place called High Performance Coatings for eight and a half years, doing ceramic coatings on exhaust systems for top fuel cars, Indy cars, street rods. Got to meet a lot of people in the industry. Chip Foose, back when he was working for Boyd, uh, they came through on a on a big Americruise uh, Rod and Custom magazine tour. How old were you then? Oh, geez, I had to have been probably 26 at that point. And... Uh, it was kind of cool, you know, I had all of these people sitting in this uh, uh, shipping area and I had a bunch of my renderings that I did just as a hobby at home when, you know, because my wife and I didn't have any money to go out all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'd sit there and draw cars, we'd watch a movie or whatever, and I had these all hanging in my office. And Ed Capen, which is the right-hand man to the uh, Metters family that run Good Guys Rod and Custom, Ed was sitting there having barbecue brisk and he looks through the office window into my shop there and he says, uh, he says, who does all those drawings? I said, oh, those are just mine. It's just a hobby. He goes, those aren't bad. You ever thought about doing those for magazines? And I said, I'd love to. 
And uh, it was two weeks later, I got my first commissioned uh, job for uh, Super Chevy and Chevy High Performance. Did a 69 Camaro for Ed that he was building with Arizona Speed Marine, which he worked for. And uh, shortly after that, I designed uh, Dave Hall's uh, new Mad. It was built by Steve's Auto Restoration. That car originally started out at Arizona Speed Marine getting built. So, you know, pretty soon everybody in Utah thought I was a big deal designer out of Utah. Everybody outside of Utah thought I was a big deal designer inside Utah. And it just kind of snowballed. So Bailey was born. Three years later, we're getting ready to have Drew. And uh, I finally convinced Charity, my wife, to let me quit my job after eight and a half years, cash in the 401k, and start out of my garage I built in my backyard. Interesting timing. So now a baby's coming, and you decide... <laughs> Perfect time to quit hey, your job, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. So Drew job. was born, and two weeks later, I quit my job, cashed in my 401k after eight and a half years for a whopping $4,800, and started my company. Within two and a half months, I had uh, Kevin working for me part time. I had a couple other friends that were working out of my garage doing graphics. Where did graphics. you find Kevin? Was he on like Craigslist or? No, no. It's funny. <laughs> uh, Kevin and I actually got to know each other. He was into the mini truck clubs and the sport truck clubs. I was into the Volkswagen clubs, and we always ended up at the same small park shows. We just kind of got to know each other, you know. And and pretty soon he was looking for a job, so I hired him for me uh, to work for me over at HBC, and we worked together for a couple of years. And uh, I quit. Kevin changed his schedule to go in at like 11 o'clock, and he worked for me for, me for about two weeks. And uh, his truck was being worked on, so I actually gave him a ride back to work, and he was 15 minutes late. Well, the old boss that we worked for was not really happy that I had left. A, knew Kevin was working for me. I dropped him off, got on the freeway. He got fired. He called me. I got off the next exit, turned around, went and picked him up, and he's like, man, that jerk fired me. I said, don't worry about it, dude. We got lots of work to do. Let's go. And it's just pretty much been like that ever since. So... And you find the right guy that, uh, that backs you up. I'm going to get all teary-eyed because I just absolutely love the guy. You know what? Um, I trust him with millions and millions of dollars in that trailer at any given time. He runs my company. He watches my back. And, uh, you know, you find somebody like that that's, you know, he's my mother trucker. He's my best friend. And we just, you know, we do everything together. Besides the fact, you know, the Indian burns, I'll take those. I'll, I'll put up with his abuse, you know. He's got a boat, and I don't want to have to get a boat, so we'll just stay buddies, you know, until I got somewhere to put a boat. But, no, he's he's a great guy. I count on him, uh, you know, nonstop. He's always got my back, so. Everybody that I've talked to that has had the opportunity to meet you and spend a little bit of time with you has said, you are that real, that kind guy that we think you are that comes across, and it comes across on the show, so we kind of get that. We, have, we like, start falling in love with you, and the... That, that word love, when you say that with Kevin, it's so evident. I mean, he, he when he will flick you crap, and you take it so well, you know, and you know it's kind of his, like, role. I mean, it, it, it is him being, that's Kevin being Kevin, isn't Kevin it? Kevin says it best. He says, you set him up, I'll knock him down. I was like, well, I didn't, really didn't think we even had to have the conversation. You do it anyway. So, no, you know what, uh, you know, Kevin, a lot of times it's funny is, People read into a lot of TV stuff a little too much, and a lot of times they're like, man, why do you take all that crap from Kevin? It's like, dude, come on. We've been friends for like well over 20 years at this point, and it's like, he doesn't bother me, and that's not, you know, that's just the way that our personalities, you know, they, they complement each other. And it's much like all the rest of the guys in the shop. Everybody's got their place. Everybody has their thing. Everybody has their strengths and their weaknesses, and we all kind of collectively make sure that everybody goes on the same direction, on the same journey. You, you don't come across like a crazy micromanager either. You you have a kind of, another, again, more stuff I've heard from other people. You've gone out and got like the best guys in their specific areas, mm -hmm. and you know they're good, and they can do what they're going to do. And you just say, here it is, have at it. You give them the guidance and right. walk away and know that they're going to get it done. And then Kevin will... He makes sure they get it done. <laughs> He's a ball buster. You know what? Um, the, the idea behind hiring the right guys to be able to accomplish so many things. Uh, a lot of people, if you watch the show, you see it's a pretty large shop. There's, on the average, about 20-plus vehicles getting worked on at any given time. And there's no way... It's hard enough just to design the theme and the and the feel of what it is that we're building. Developing colors, obviously developing the relationship and the trust with the client to let us go to the moon on their car, you know, uh, whatever we want to do and make sure that they're going to be happy with it at the end of the day because obviously they're paying for it and they have to, you know, want to drive it. My, my job is basically to design the feel and the theme of all aspects of detail, but it's up to them to look at the rendering and get an idea of the feel. I mean, if I put the... 
a, a nice engine cover over the top of the uh, core support and down the sides of the engine bay. I can't tell you exactly where the seams are going to make the most sense. I'll put them in there as a fill. I'll put the radiator cap wherever, or overflow bottle cap wherever. Obviously, those things are needing to be changed as needed. Hood latches, sometimes we decide to go with a modern hood latch, and we'll change that stuff out. But basically, my guys have the ability to look at the rendering and go, okay, it's not up to me to change everything that Dave's put down because this is what we're building. But if I need the you know a little different shape here, or drop this, or raise this, or whatever, they have the ability to make those decisions themselves. And, and uh, they know what to expect. They know not that they don't have to ask me every last detail that may have to be changed. Or even if I haven't got the engine bay design yet, they'll already know what I would likely do because they've built so many cars with me. It's not that we do the same thing over and over again, but my guys have been with me for so long, they know what to expect and what I would likely say. And of course, if I'm there, I'm more than happy to come over and just go, no, let's just do this and this and this. My engineering degree from Legos gave me the ability to make anything work. And my ability to talk to my guys and say, what if, and that's what the whole business is based on is what ifs, you know, what if you just make the decision yourself or let's just do this? And they're like, yeah, cool. So, you know, it's just, like I say, it's, it's great to have that many craftsmen that know how to pull it off. You are real innovative. You have a couple of things that, that I'm curious how they came about because you, you do your own custom handles that you, you came up with. You guys figured out not just how to make them look good, flush out. I mean, I can't imagine seeing those and not want them. Everybody would want those. And let's talk about that first, but then I want to know about your, your new wheel thing that you're doing with that white wall trick. <laughs> Why wouldn't anybody want that? Those are two things yeah. everybody loves. Well, you know what? Uh, the door handles, actually, it was pretty cool. We were building a car for Larry Johnson, a 1956 Bel Air, and it was a car that was already built by Strictly Street Rods. He got wiped out in a four-way stop, and somebody forgot to use the stop sign and actually pay attention to it, so it knocked the whole front end off the car. So we got the car in, and, and uh, uh, Larry Johnson, if a lot of people might recognize the cars that he had built. He had a lot of cars done with Boyd Coddington. Uh, one of the last ones that he had built by Boyd was the 61 Bubble Top. It was orange and gold built on American Hot Rod. Had the big five, uh, 572 in it. He sold that car at Bear Jackson later on, but basically we were going to build this car and he wanted it smooth, but to still have the classic lines. So we flipped the bumpers. We uh, redid a bunch of the trim, one piece of the, the front fender trim, which normally is three pieces. We wanted to make it smooth, but still look like a classic car. Well, you usually shave the door handles if you want the smooth look. But we wanted a functional, usable door handle. And I had a buddy of mine that had an Aston Martin Vantage, and it had a flush-mounted door handle. And it basically pushed in where the thumb part was, and it popped into your hand. And I was like, well, that's easy enough, because if you take the 56 Chevy door handle off the push button, it all it's doing is pushing on a little tab a half an inch inside the door shell. So we were just simply going to make a cantilever that basically did the same thing. It would push on that same lever. So we came up with the first set, and I was like, dude, these are cool. People are already asking about it, just seeing the car getting built in the shop. And so I was like, you know what? This might be the one thing this welfare kid growing up might need to go and get a patent on. And that's what we did. We chased that patent. We got both design and uh, utility, and the rest is history. We've been selling them like hotcakes. They're a great addition. We have three different styles. They're available uh, both in chrome and in paintable. So if you do want a shaved door handle look, but still a functional door handle, you know, this way you don't have to worry about your poppers and your solenoids, your battery going dead or the solenoid not working or pulling hard enough. It's still just, it's the best of both worlds. And that's what is a lot of my design eye. I like things to look classic. They'll be in style 12 years from now, 20 years from now, 30, 40 years from now. We didn't build a spaceship out of it. We kept a very clean, stylish line, but it still has, it's a classic car. It's supposed to have chrome in it if that's what you're building. So that's, the door handles have been awesome. The wide whites, I actually didn't try and patent those. Uh, I am the guy that developed them. I built those with uh, Mike Curtis that was working for Larry Dove at Evod Wheels. Yeah. And uh, I was building Apollo Anton Ono's 64 Cadillac convertible. And we built that one on Hot Rod Television before Bitch and Rides came along. And basically, I was trying to come up with an idea. He wanted a wide white on the car, but I wanted something that looked custom. And I'm sitting there thinking, we had these 16 and a half inch brakes on that car. Well, you had to run at least a 20 inch wheel, which was only going to allow you half of the profile for wide white being vulcanized in, which is great. They're a great application. There's companies that make modern tires and they'll vulcanize the wide white on. That wasn't going to fit this one. So I'm sitting there looking through Evod's uh, show pieces that they've done a lot of other Riddler cars and that type of stuff. And he had this uh, picture of this wagon. It was a really cool old school wagon. 
And much like the tuner cars where they're uh, a lot of the casted wheels, they machine a groove around the perimeter of the lip and they put like a red line in. Well, that's how this polished wheel was. And they had this red line painted in there. It was just a little, you know, three eighths inch red line that was dropped into the edge of the uh, wheel lip. I sat there and thought about it for a second. I grabbed my pad of paper and I drew a cutaway profile of what I thought would work. Mounting pad all the way to the outside. It's all machined. And then they put the, they do the five axis CNC and give the detail of the rim. I called up Larry and I said, hey, Larry, I got the idea for these Cadillac wheels. I'm not going to vulcanize. I want you to build a 22. I'm going to send you the Pirelli tires. I want you to flow it into the tire through the rim protector section. I want it to look like the wide whites part of the rim. Oh, that's fantastic. So that was where that all started. There's now a guy trying to patent that, and I'm waiting for, to, I'm, that's fine, it doesn't matter. The wheel racket I learned very early on from Larry Johnson, which was also one of the owners of uh, American Racing Wheels way back in the day. The wheel racket, you change one thing, you waste all of your money you've ever made on something that you tried patenting in the wheel market, just trying to sue somebody to stop building something. They make one change, you're just suing them all over again. So just, you know, my hobby is building cars, not suing <laughs> people, so it just was one of those things where I'm waiting for the guy to call me up and say I can't do it anymore and I'll just refresh his memory where he came up with it and I'll just continue to do what I do. And that's been very popular for our cars because I like the performance of the big brakes, the big motors, but still keeping them classic and this gives us the ability to put a massive brake inside of a very, what looks like a very small rim but it's yet quite big because the brakes were actually into, if you look straight into those wheels, the brakes are actually into the wide white section. So. That's a perfect solution for that problem. We all know we had those white walls, the big white walls. We're out there with our like Ajax or whatever, year <laughs> after year, trying to keep them white, trying to make uh -huh. them look good. And ears will always look good. If it they look bad, the you just repaint them because they're just painted. So I remember the old days of the Volkswagens, and boy, if you were at an automotive swap meet and ran into somebody with the porta walls, you could stick the wide white between your tire, your standard tire, because I never had the money to buy actual real wide whites. So it was porta walls for me. So here you were, this this guy that was coming up, looking at other builders, and now you've come up with something with the handles that other builders buy your stuff to mm -hmm. put on their rigs. Man, that's got to feel good. It's pretty cool. You know what? They don't call it copying. They call it research. And uh, you know what? Uh, when we go to a car show, we, we go to compete, obviously. We're, we're very serious about what it is that we built. But at the end of the day, once you get there, it's all up to the judges. And at that point, we'd rather be buds and have a beer and hang out with the other builders and stuff rather than looking over our shoulder going, well, I wonder what they're, you know, doing next or, you know, this is... We're, anybody that builds cars for a living is very lucky to be in the industry, and if they're doing well, you, that's a dream come true. And you know, certainly we found that. So we don't have any animosity against other builders. It's you know, there's an ask for every seat, is what I always say. That's right. You had uh, you mentioned Chip before, but you know, we all had those people that we kind of looked at and said, "Man, they're doing stuff I like, and this guy's doing stuff I like." Were there a few guys that you could name that you'd say those were guys I, I liked what they were doing? You know, what's funny is I didn't grow up in the automotive, you know, my, I didn't have parents that had hot rods and we went to car shows growing up. My cousin and I always used to go to those. But when I was a kid, I remember a, a show called Captain Kangaroo. It was on Saturday mornings and he had George Barris there. George Barris was basically talking about, uh, you know, model building. And so he had a little F100 or D100 pickup, the little Dodge pickup uh, van front. And he was showing how to hang it, and you'd bend a wire hanger, and you could hang it and spray paint it and stuff. And I was just, I was into models, you know. I was like, I was like watching. I'm getting all stoked, like, as soon as he's done and Bugs Bunny hour's over, I'm going to build my model cars again. And uh, so he showed doing that, but what blew me away is uh, right after he showed how to do that, and he showed the model going together, they opened a curtain. It was full size behind the curtain, built and done. It was a fire truck that they had built. And, I, and at that point, my imagination went right through the roof. So now you can draw it, build it, scale, and then build the real thing. All I could do is just continue to try and build those same skills and the, and the design I had growing up and just being so into cars that one day I go from models or design, which was a lot easier and faster for me, to an actual real car. And it was kind of a dream come true. Chip, uh, I knew Chip back when he worked for Boyd and just, just in passing, very nice guy. And I got to know Boyd a little bit as well from working at HPC. And so I always admired their stuff. Uh, Bobby Alloway has been around forever. Uh, I remember he came through on that, uh, one of those Cruises, and he had his, uh, uh, I think it was an Amber winner, little Speed Star black with the classic flames, what they called long tip Ohio classic flames. 
And uh, so I always had a lot of these guys, uh, Posies, Ken Fennickle back east. Um, there was just a lot of great builders that I always admired, but... You know, of course, the king at the time was Boyd. Yeah. So Chip's done very well for himself. I've always admired J uh, Chip's ability to design something that's smooth and carry a theme and pick the right two tones and that kind of stuff. Um, Tom Taylor, I'm a huge fan of Tom Taylor's designs. Uh, Steve Stanford. Uh, I mean, boy, the list goes on and on. I've always watched those things, you know, admiring their renderings in magazines and and their project planning and then being able to actually go and do that myself it's it's kind of a dream come true i doubt you've even had time to sit back and realize that that you are now that guy that we're looking at and we're saying dave kendig's the guy he's that's that's the guy that i want to that i want to be like it's so trippy it's it's <laughs> it's you in that we started out three months ago and we did our first show and and we, we thought, we're going to do it on a topic that'll just be easy, so we kind of ease into all this stuff. And we said, well, let's do it on, on TV shows that we're watching. And it, it was the Alaskan Bush people and all these other kind of topics that came up. And we said, you know, we know we're going to be about cars and motorcycles, so let's, let's kick the other stuff and just go for that. When we got to cars, one of the things that we had, both Alan and I had been watching your show, and one statement I made, very clear, and I could not have predicted today, three months later, I'd be sitting here talking <laughs> to you. But what I had said was, if I had the wallet, it was going to, and I'm very finicky. Anybody who knows me knows I'm artistic. We share these kind of similar things, very artistic, and I want to tell everybody to the detail what I want. And what I said is, if I had the money, I was just going to give somebody a check, say, white, black with red accents, and walk. Who would I have do it? It's a Dave Kendick's crew. Oh, cool. You and your crew, and it and it goes together because it's you and your crew that you put together that make this whole thing. Well, you picked the right colors because that's actually my company color, so you got it in right there. That that makes it easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to say I copied yours, but it's, it's, it's just <laughs> no. white and black is my deal too. Yeah. I love the red. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Uh, so, what's uh, what's next? We kind of know where where we've been and kind of what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Do you do you like look out there and say? I still haven't done this. So, oh, I got something for you. You know, we, we both came up with models and all that kind of stuff. Had a model made of your car yet? Had a Hot Wheel? Don't we kind of look at that and go, ooh, that would be cool? Uh, I'm waiting for it because I was always a big fan. You know, uh, I'm, I can't tell you how many hours I sat there with model cars. and No model car was safe on my windowsill for more than about two weeks because I'd steal the roof off of it or take the wheels or the motor or whatever. But... Uh, I, I can't tell you how many hours I spent making my model cars roll, and I'd just sit there and look at it on the desk, you know, that I'd build my model cars down my room, and and uh, it'd be awesome to see a die cast of one of our cars. I think it'd be really cool. I'd like to, you know, like I said, I was always a big fan of Hot Wheels, and uh, I'd love to see, a, a, you know, Hot Wheels versions, whether it's, you know, the... 164th scale or getting up into the 124th stuff for die cast. I, I just think it'd be really cool. It's, it, we haven't approached it yet, but who knows? I, you know, I, I know you don't want anybody to like, there's no jinx in this. You are that guy. I'm saying you, you, we know where this thing is going. People want that. I want all of us enthusiasts that are out that are saying, you're the guy. I want that kind of stuff. I want to go down and spend my $15 on a Hot Wheel, and I want to spend my $45 on the die cast, and I want to get a model and put it together that is your stuff. Yeah, so be cool. I think it's going to happen. Thank you. It, it's just, I, and I can't wait till it will. I know that you'll be <laughs> pumped up, and, and we'll get yeah, to have fun. You know what? Kevin Kevin always makes fun of me. It's, uh, it's a good thing we have 14-foot doors you know, in the shop, because if I see that, I'm going to have to walk out through one of those. My head will be huge. <laughs> so. I, I, I hate to say that. I, I kind of want to go here with something with you. I asked Cherry this too. I thought it was pretty funny. Is that what kind of cars do you guys drive in real life? What kind of cars do you guys drive? Do you want to? Do you even want to mention that? Or because I thought oh, no, it was you'll funny. get to see it actually on season three. Uh, uh, I have what I call a snob rod, and a snob rod is basically like a really nice Mercedes, but you hot rod it up a little bit so you don't look pretentious. Uh, yeah, I drive a CL63 AMG Mercedes, which is the big body two door hard top. Doesn't have a B pillar, which I love. I like rolling all the windows down. There's no pillar there. Uh, that's temporary. I've always been a big fan of supercars. So who knows? We get uh, get a couple more things taken care of. You'll probably see me in a, a higher-end snob route. It'll probably be a Lamborghini. I'm looking at the Hurricane. Uh, you know, I want to we'll see, see what that. Happens. What's her grocery getter? 
a Chrysler 300 on 22 is lowered. I can't get her to sell it though. We, I'd like we, to get her something nicer. You know, we've we've moved up a little bit. The car's been paid off for a couple of years, and and it's old. We love those, and we were talking about that, and we shared the same thing. We looked at all of them, and what we saw, we liked. So in that. it's a classic, you know, the silhouette of a Chrysler 300. Hers is a 2008, but it's the Heritage Edition, mm -hmm. so it's got the it's cool vanilla with cool vanilla 22 inch wheels, cool vanilla interior. It's nice, but it's starting to show its age. It's still low miles. Are you interested? <laughs> I wouldn't mind having a yeah, dick. But I'll, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> Send me an email. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll shoot you some pics over, you know. But, uh, you know, she's she's always been very happy. Actually, uh, the next car for her is going to be a 67 Chevelle. I sold hers about 23 years ago and bought her a Volkswagen Beetle. I know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. We couldn't afford the gas. Her and I were uh, first moved into an apartment. We lived together for two years before we got married. And we were sweating a $235 a month apartment payment. And uh, so the Malibu went down the road, and we bought her a 63 Bug for exactly the same price. The Bug we, we, we had for a while. We got married. We drove that to our uh, honeymoon and stuff. It was a cool car, but in retrospect, I should have hung on to the 67 Chevelle, and now I have to replace it, which is going to be much more expensive than what I sold her car for. What are we putting Bailey in? Because I know we saw her drive the car, test drive the car that day, and she was having the zipper, too yeah. much fun is what I was saying. I'm thinking, I'm thinking like a big car with a Volkswagen motor. <laughs> yeah, well, that would certainly make me feel a lot happier because she's got a lead foot. Um, you know what? Actually, she uh, Charity's parents, uh, Dick and Bonnie, have had a big car collection for a long time. But I think since I met Dick, he hasn't worked on anything since I met his daughter. Uh, so we're going to start a 57 Corvette project with him. He just retired. So I've got an Art Morrison frame coming. We're going to do an LS. We're going to work on that car together at the shop. And we'll get to see that one built on the TV series. Bailey took over a 1967 Volkswagen Beetle that they've had since 1972. So she's already got a set of 15-inch, uh, you know, BRMs, a drop axle. We're going to hop up the motor a bit. That's her project. She's going to work on that all by herself. We'll give her a couple of hands here and there and make sure she's going in the right direction. But she's a car chick. How far behind is Drew from driving then? Drew's driving right now. How old is he then? Uh, 16 and a half. Yeah, he's coming. Actually, he's older than that. He's coming up uh, May 14th is his birthday, so he'll be 17. So is he sweeping floors? I mean, uh, uh, Bailey's Bailey's in there doing he stuff. Has, What's he doing? He has no, hardly any interest at all in the hot rod shop. Bailey is totally in 100%, but Drew, Drew's actually, he's, he keeps himself very busy, you know, chasing chicks, forgetting to wash his truck. Um, not changing his oil, forgetting to take the garbage out. <laughs> I got a whole list. Bringing his laundry up. He doesn't do his laundry. Doesn't do dishes. But no, he's very involved in uh, like the theater stuff at high school and chasing chicks. And uh, he builds sets. He's very hands-on in that respect, but not so much into the car stuff. At least right now, you know, he's trying to find his own direction, which is totally cool. And you got to remember, he, he might be a little jealous of the other kid, which is the shop, which is two weeks younger than he is. So he was born two weeks after that. I was in business. And I spent a lot of time, and, uh, and, I, and I look back and I kind of regret some things. You know, I mean, we're close, but I, I do regret a little bit of not spending as much time with him as I did trying to grow my business and take care of my family. But in the same sense, I think he understands. I know he understands. But I don't know. It'll click to him one day. I got a two hundred thousand dollars sixty seven Corvette Tri Power four twenty seven car that's not mine. It's sitting in the garage. It took his spot. He's now out in the weather for the next couple of weeks until the uh, remodel on the office is done. So who knows? I think he'll probably see that Corvette a hundred times and then finally go, "Hey man, can I drive it?" And I'll say, "Yeah, you can." That should be all it takes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what? What? There's a little thing you mentioned in there that he's into, like, theater and stuff. What's it like when Dave Kindek goes to school to watch his kid's movie? I mean, you're walking in, and people kind of like, is that Dave Kindek? Uh, uh, I get it everywhere. Um, you know, this this lifestyle certainly has changed a little bit, and it certainly has been fun. But, uh, you know, I mean, every once in a while, you just want to get together with your friends and, you know, go out and have a drink or go to dinner or whatever, and, and uh, or even just walk into a store without being recognized. It's a little hard to, to hide this. And we thought, <laughs> it was kind of funny is we just uh, was at uh, Salt Lake Autorama a couple of weeks ago, and that's our hometown. And we put four cars in, and we did not do a commercial booth. It was uh, We had so many shows going at the same time, and we've been doing that one since uh, 2000. And so we was like, you know what, let's just let's chill out. Let's let other people have a little bit of a turn, you know. And, and uh, so we took, you know, only four cars instead of 15 like we've done in the past quite a few times. And I told everybody, I was like, hey, 
I said, Kevin, we're going to go to Odd Ram on Friday night, kind of late, and I'm going to I'm going to wear a disguise so I can just walk around, have a beer, you know, talk to my buddies, hang out, and you know, just enjoy the car show. So I was going to dress like an old white-haired biker did with like leathers and stuff. I don't have any; I'd have to borrow everything. And Kevin says to me, he says, "What are you going to do with you?" I said, "I'm going to put a big white beard on." He goes. Dude, that'll last like two minutes. The minute we get there, you're going to be like, see somebody, and you're going to go, hey, bro, it's me. <laughs> and then everybody will know, and then you're just going to look like an idiot in shaps. And I was like, yeah, you're probably right. So we just went ahead and went, you know, and I got to see three or four cars the entire time we were there. It was cool, and I, and I love that. You know, I, I really dig people that are into what we're doing and appreciate what we're doing. So I, I'm never, like, bothered by, you know, getting surrounded by people, but... You know, it's a, it is a little bit different. You know, I grew up going to car shows like this and being able to walk around and check everything out, and it's a little difficult unless I get in here early. It's almost impossible. Well, I love hearing the background from Charity and understanding where you guys come from a business side and finding out what and how you do your business. You're not going anywhere other than up. It, it, your plan is the model that every young builder coming in should be doing. If, if they had the ability to talk to you and understand how to put people together as a team and go somewhere, mm -hmm. they should model exactly what you're doing because it's, it, it's, it's on. Very simple piece of advice I give to anybody that's wanting to go out and venture on and, and build a business. Um, the business will take care of you, but at very first, you have to take care of the business. Charity and I were very uh, stern about making sure that anytime we were making money, we weren't robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, we weren't taking money and restoring our house on customer in, uh, deposits and that kind of stuff. We continued to put it back into more guys, better guys, more equipment, more space, more advertising. A lot of the first cars that we built that hit the map and, and did quite well, top 10 in the nation, uh, if I had a budget this big, I'd overbuild it that much more. As long as I had the right relationship with the customer, then I would be able to borrow that car with their trust and take it out to a show, I'd sell two more jobs. I continued to do that. I kept reinvesting back into the company, never what we call raping the company. And I find a lot of guys that get into business, the first time they get a $40,000 or $100,000 deposit, if they're even you know building that scale of car, they go blow half of it on themselves, go buy a new truck or whatever, instead of building the car and building the company. And so that's one of the biggest things I can tell them. That and you know set your goals high, like I first said at the beginning of the interview. Set your goals high. If you land just below it, it's not so bad. Just keep going. And... Uh, as far as guys that are wanting to just get into car building, the advice I'd give is get a project. Going to school is very important. You know, if, if you learn better textbook style, that's very important. But until you learn how to work with your hands, you know, if you've been out in the garage with your dad, you have a huge advantage on a lot of people because you've had the opportunity to build something, you know, to learn the mistakes. You have to learn from that stuff. And so, you know, getting hands on is by far the, the biggest thing. So I ask my guys to do you know, build the cars, but I don't ask them to do anything that I can't do myself. Now, a lot of them have a lot more skill at this point because I've got better equipment, which I never had, you know, growing up. So, but. Well, congratulations on what you're doing and best wishes as you're going forward. We'll all be watching, rooting for you and, and seeing the great things to come. I thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. It's been a great pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time.